Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. My name is James Walsh from the PLSA's policy team and it's a great pleasure to welcome you back and also to welcome our keynote speaker this afternoon, the television history guy, uh, Dan Snow. Dan, welcome to you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there's plenty of the news at the moment, of course. Uh, we're just talking about it, about the relationship between the EU uh, and the UK, between Europe and the UK. Uh, and Dan is going to touch on that very uh, hist uh, important topic, but from a more historical and long-term perspective, perhaps, than what we're uh, used to. He's going to be taking uh, questions afterwards, so please do uh, put your hands up, send in questions anonymously if you wish uh, via the conference app. Dan told me make the questions as rude as you like, so uh, no holds uh, barred. You can tweet as well, of course, about the session. Uh, you all know the hashtag, I think, on the screen. Uh, perhaps not, but it's uh, hashtag PLSA invest. And speaking of Twitter, uh, just be warned um, that Dan takes uh, no prisoners with anyone who's not paying proper uh, attention. I noted from his Twitter account just a couple of days ago, uh, he uh, tweeted a photograph, I think it was from the West Coast Main Line, Dan, yep. who was a fellow rail passenger there who was uh, viewing a Dan Snow history program, no less, on his iPad, but had unfortunately nodded off uh, while doing so. <laughs> Uh, so he's now, he's now gone viral, so you have been warned. Uh, anyway, Dan, we're all wide awake here at Pillar Say. We're looking forward to what you've got to say. Ladies and gentlemen, Dan Snow. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. That's very kind. Yes, I tweet shamed him. He will never, he will rue the day he passed out watching a program about the East India Company. He probably rues the day he turned uh, that program on. Now I like to make these comments, I like to make things difficult for these camera operators at the back because they get a bit lazy, people standing behind this. I hope you're ready, you guys. I'm going to walk around a bit. Good. Uh, very good to see you all. We're going to go on a rampage through Britain and European, British and European history. Don't panic. It's not going to be that long, and we're going to have a chance for questions at the end. As I say, any kind of question don't have to be related to this exact topic, but it'd be great to hear what you have to say. Uh, uh, history was the, the elephant in the room, I think, during the Brexit referendum. Both sides appealed to history. Uh, but I think, the, and, and of course, as we saw during the SNP, uh, the, the uh, SNP's push for independence up here, a hugely important part of it was history. It's a side that, that the... Uh, the in campaign, well, the both in campaigns, if you like, weren't very good at talking about, but the, the out campaigns were particularly good at leveraging. So and I think history is important because, not just because I'm a history geek and I find it fascinating, because we all, you all know your day job is trying to work out what's going to happen in the future. It's very hard to know what's going to happen in the future because it hasn't happened yet. Whereas what has happened is the past. One thing we can argue about, of course, disagree about, but we can find a place for shared facts and shared understandings is the past. It's not the best indicator we have what's going to happen, but it's somewhere to start. The past is an imperfect guide. And what's really interesting about the Brexit debate, what's really interesting about our relationship with Europe, is this is not a new phenomenon. The inhabitants of these islands have been asking themselves what to do about them over there for 2,000 years of recorded history. In fact, what's really fascinating is our first mention of Britain in recorded history is actually dealing with exactly this. It's Julius Caesar writing his fake news biography and mentioning this island off the northwest coast of Europe who had been, who had been trying to play a, a political game, strategic game, around who to support as Julius Caesar conquered big chunks of Northwest Europe. This is a very ancient argument, and it's one that we've been having ever since. And why is that? Well, it's obvious why it is. It's because of geography. The geography hasn't changed. Britain, uh, the, U well, the UK, the British Isles, are an archipelago off the northwest, just off the northwest coast of Europe. Uh, we get battered first by the Atlantic gales, as you all know. It's wet. It's allegedly warm. Uh, but it's, it's out there in the Gulf Stream. The reason that uh, the, the, well, one, of, one of our many natural advantages, since we're on the subject of our geography, is that the wind tends to blow from west to east, which has kept many French invasion fleets in their ports over the years. That's why it used to be called a Protestant wind, and that is why uh, the wind tends to blow that way. But we are, so we are not part of, of Europe, and yet we are so close. 
The other thing that's notable about our archipelago, despite everyone going Britain's an island, well, sort of Britain is sort of an island, but the UK isn't and never has been. We are a heterodox archipelago. We are a complicated archipelago, not like Japan. We're a deeply complicated archipelago. There are several groups of people, or traditionally several groups of people who have lived in this quite small space. And only for 100 years of the last, of, of the last thousands of years, for 100 years has there been a centralized state that controls the whole of the British Isles. Quite an interesting thought. From 1801 to the 1920s, there was, for what the UK equaled the British Isles. For the rest of the time, that has not been true. So we've got, uh, and hence, as we all, of course, that's been everyone's talking about that at the moment, because we do, in fact, have a land border with the EU, as prescient people are pointing out during the referendum campaign. Um, so that's important thing to remember. Let's, let's, let's deal with the, the, the closeness to Europe first, and then this idea of a potentially quite heterodox, potentially quite di di diverse set of islands that we live on. What happens in Europe affects us here. What happens in Europe over there inevitably comes here to our shores. Our fates are intertwined. Uh, we have been enormously influenced by events in Europe, and we in turn have influenced Europe. Uh, our language, let's go easy, pensio, pensions, pensio. It means, of course, in Latin, it means effectively to pay, a, pay, a payment. Uh, our traditional religion, so that's a, that's a word, that's what you're all doing, is a word that has come from Europe. And in fact, pensions, the history of pensions, as you will know better than I do, uh, are, is, a, is a European idea. There was, there was a, tr a habit of paying pensions in the Roman army, and then more recently Bismarck in the 19th century, trying to pull the rug out from the socialists, said he would, he would pay everyone in Germany over the age of 65 a pension. Uh, so so that, that is a, a great example of something that came to these shores. Our traditional religions whether that is our ancient belief systems or Christianity or Protestantism, uh, Catholicism, then Protestantism, uh, came from, uh, or, or all foreign implants, as are our constitutional arrangements. Kings, parliaments, French word. Um, so, and, and in fact, everything else. Protestantism, parliaments, pensions, plague, physics, the other Ps, all came from Europe. Printing. Good one. Uh, this city that we're standing in, Whisper It, Edinburgh, was built by the English, but of German, recently German descent. London was built by the Italians. Dublin was built by the Vikings. Cardiff was built by the English too. Uh, our DNA, as we know, comes from waves of migrants. Um, by the way, I, I should say, because you're probably bored of hearing that DNA migrants thing. I mean, I'm not, this is not a case either for open door migration or join, uh, being a member of the EU, but it's, a, it's, a, it's talking about how, whether we like it or not, our fates are intertwined with Europe. Uh, every, most, well, lots of Scottish kings and nearly every, nearly every single Briti English and British king has married a foreign spouse, a European spouse. Uh, Queen Victoria's immediate family spoke German in a domestic context. Um, and, our, and our arts and our sciences, of course, hugely, hugely influenced by Europe. Steam engines, embarrassingly, idea nicked off a Frenchman. The Spitfire wing, brutal to admit this, very dependent on, on European ideas about aviation. Uh, and uh, steel, even steel, that great British invention, owes a lot to a, a European steel-making tradition. So, what, so what, do the, what have the great strategists of, of English and British history done about this? Um, and this is important. There has been an understanding that you need to influence what happens in Europe because that, that thing, be it positive or negative, is going to arrive on these shores. There's been an understanding you have to reach out beyond the White Cliffs of Dover. Uh, then, but then it's also, coming back to that heterodox idea of, of this archipelago, there's been, this is for London policymakers, there has been a desire to stop uh, the, the, or to, to keep a lid on the potential for conflict and instability within the archipelago, within the British Isles. So the two, threat, the two threats to Britain traditionally uh, have been 
foreign invasion and, and domestic instability. The, bl the bloodiest war in British history, we now think per capita, in terms of the number of people alive at the time and the number of casualties they were, were the civil wars of the 17th century, the wars of the three kingdoms, when the Irish, the Scots, the English and Welsh all went absolutely mentally each other uh, and a vast, vast proportion of the population was brutalised or killed. Now, let's, so, so let's talk about, let's talk about uh, this idea of the foreign threat. Let's talk about the strategists dealing with Europe first. The English Channel, everybody, the English Channel is not a moat. It is not a moat, it is a bridge. It is a bridge. Until the invention of the railway, in fact, today, 95% of the stuff that comes in and sits on the shelves of supermarkets and the shoes that I'm wearing uh, and this radio mic, 95% of that stuff comes in by boat. The, the water is a bridge. Until the invention of railways and mo roads and motor cars, the land was the problem. Getting, up, getting from here, Newcastle to Edinburgh was a total nightmare unless you're on a boat. Getting from Leeds to Liverpool, forget about it, nightmare. Uh, so if we got 1066, Bayer Tapestries coming back, we all saw that the other day, people said it's the last invasion of Britain. That is the kind of stuff that makes historians go completely insane. <laughs> it's like asking a physicist whether mass is equal right across the universe, apparently. I don't know, but apparently it's not quite. So it, it's the same thing. It's of little consequence to anyone else, but hugely important to us. So this is what happened after 1066. The Vikings landed in 1068. King Harold's sons landed in 1069, fought a battle against the Normans. Robert of Normandy, the king's brother, landed in 1101, tried to steal the kingdom. Matilda, big fan of Matilda, by the way. She landed in 1139, tried to fight her brother Stephen for the throne. And Matilda's son, Henry II, landed in 1153 with another invasion force. We have been invaded countless times from Europe. Absolutely. They spent the whole time. People have spent the entire time crossing the Channel and evading us. Therefore, there's been an understanding from policymakers that in order to, to, in order to protect what goes on here, you have to, there's a great Swahili expression, if you want to defend yourself, you have to stand outside your house. And the greatest strategists in British history have understood that perfectly. Elizabeth I, Churchill, Alfred the Great, Castlereagh, Wellington, Thatcher, you name it, they've, they've understood that. If you don't fight in Europe, you're going to fight in East Anglia or in Fife. So that's the, that, and coming back to Julius Caesar, that's exactly the point. So we've got these tribes in Britain, and they know that Roman superpower is marching north through Gaul. What do they do? What do those tribes in Britain do? They have two choices. They can try and help, those, help their Gallic neighbours, cousins, fight the Romans, or they can just back off and just hope that Julius Caesar doesn't, doesn't fancy crossing the Channel. And in, in the end, of course... We don't know enough about it, but what seems to have happened, they tried to get on the front foot, didn't work, Julius Caesar invaded anyway, and, uh, and invaded Britain. Um, Athel Stan, the greatest king of England that most people don't really know about, the man who sort of made England, he married his female relatives into the European royal houses. His sister married the Holy Roman Empress. He understood that it was vital to get out there and start peddling and, and trying to get influence within Europe. Uh, then, then, of course, we have another, the Anglo-Saxons were themselves European invaders, the Normans replaced them, more European invaders, uh, and, and we end up with a situation when, and of course, the Normans, they spoke French, they brought their European ideas, they brought the word pensio to, to Britain, Britain. Uh, and they, we then end up with a situation where England actually ended up as a trans-channel state. There were English places in Europe, Dunkirk and Calais, for example, were out to the 16th century, so almost 500 years. The English regarded the northwest coast of Europe as a vital strategic interest, like, Do like for Dover. D Dunkirk and Calais were as important as Dover in, in English policy making, because they were on the other side of the water and they allowed us to have a hand in what was going on over there. Queen Elizabeth I, brilliant strategist, she fought Philip of Spain, you know, the famous expression, a man who controlled half the world defeated by a woman who controlled half an island. But what a woman. And she uh, fought Philip of Spain, not about Sir Francis Drake stealing things in the Caribbean, or, she fought because of what was going on in Holland. She did not want a Spanish superpower dominating that coast of Europe. And that's what British policy has been all about ever since. If an enemy is dominating the coast of Europe, and those big invasion ports in Europe, that is very, very bad. That's why Britain got involved in the Napoleonic Revolutionary Wars, First World War, Second World War, you name it. Luckily for you, I'm going to go through them all now. Um, 
And, and then, but, 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 but our leaders have absolutely wrestled with isolationism, of course. Uh, sometimes the Stuarts, for example, our Stuart kings, they quite liked Europe. They, 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 found, they, rather, they rather admired the, the, sort of the, des, the rather glamorous despots of Europe, be the Spanish Habsburg court, Louis XIV, of course. They signed treaties. They allowed British troops to serve under Louis XIV, the French king. The Duke of Monmouth, who was Charles II's illegitimate son, fought for the French at the siege of Maastricht. He pl plunged into the breach. D'Artagnan, the real D'Artagnan beside him, D'Artagnan was killed, and Monmouth went on to win great glory in front of Louis XIV looking on. It made Charles II so proud. So, so we have engaged, but then they were seeking to engage with Europe because they understood that it, engagement was important. Then we have the opposite. We have often West Country, Protestant West Countrymen, like Sir Francis Drake, like Walter Raleigh, who hate Europe. They're Protestants. They, they believe that Britain's fate lies out there in the New World, in, 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 ca in cannibalizing the, the great empires of France and Spain and Portugal and the New World. So there's always been this tension. We see it, and we, this is what, exactly what we're seeing today. There's always been this tension between engagement and isolation. Um, in the 18th century, you start to see this weird pattern. There's all these many, many wars in the 18th century, and this weird pattern emerges where, time and again, we enter big European wars, and they're always in big coalitions. And those coalitions, to fight, and they're always doing one thing. They're trying to stop one nation in Europe dominating, usually France, dominating Western Europe. Because that is going to be bad for British trade. It's going to be dangerous in terms of they might invade Britain at some stage. It's bad. Uh, it, 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 the politics is dangerous. Um, they can shut the mouths of the great rivers to Brit the British merchant ships on which the wealth of this kingdom depends. Um, and those, but those, so we fight these coalitions. And they are a total nightmare. Coalitions are a nightmare. They are expensive. They, you don't get what you want. You, they are inefficient. They are a total pain in the ass. But on the whole, they win. And it's something to think about. And there was one war in the 18th century which Britain fought completely alone, the American War of Independence, and it lost. And we fought all, the other, we fought all these other battles. And if you think of the great battles of British history, which don't worry, I'm not going to bore you particularly. But if, I, if you thought, so actually, no, what I will say quickly, I will come back to the one thing. And what would, there was a pattern emerge, which in opposition, MPs would get furious about spending British money on, on propping up the elector of Brandenburg and the elector of Hanover as they fought the French on the Rhine. And William Pitt, the elder, would be like, why is our money? We should, so let's spend money on Royal Navy ships and go and conquer Canada. And we are just shoveling subsidies to these European, these hopeless Europeans who we have very limited control over. And then they'd get into power, and William Pitt, whilst in power, became absolutely infamous for shoveling money to said European uh, colleagues, because they see, once they got into power, they see that the need to secure the continent Everything else stems from that. And William Pitt, this great expression, he says, America was conquered in Europe. So, so because Frederick the Great, because all these British allies in Europe were able to hold down and pen the French in and uh, all the Austrians and, and make sure they didn't emerge as these great hegemonic powers, it meant that Britain was then free to go and conquer the rest of the world and could keep it at the, in the peace treaty. So America was conquered in Europe. And I remember David Cameron, who met, he didn't, wasn't the first person to make that journey. So David Cameron was a backbench MP, it didn't really matter, slagged off Europe the whole time, and ended up having the fight of his political life, speaking up for Europe and Britain's entanglement with the, with the continent. So yeah, if you think of, the great, of these great battles, these great landmarks of British history, you can think of Blenheim and Dettingen and Malplaquet and Waterloo uh, and, and Ypres and Passchendaele and Somme and the Battle of Amiens, which is in August this year. It's the 100th anniversary. It's a very important battle no one's ever heard of. Uh, and then 1940 and then, um, then D-Day and then the Ruhr. All of those, all of those battles were fought by the British in coalition. Do you know the Battle of Waterloo? The Battle of Waterloo, Duke of Wellington, great, greatest Brit who ever lived, born in Ireland, brackets, never mind. He's, he, one third of his army at Waterloo was English, one third. In fact, British. And, and that third was m mostly Irish and, and Scots as well. One third of the army. The rest were German, Dutch, and, and, and what we might describe loosely as Belgian now. Uh, so these were massive coalition efforts. In the 19th century, what happened was something very interesting. After these terrible wars in the 18th century, uh, we're getting to the modern world, guys. I'm almost done. Don't panic. Um, in, in, in the 19th century, something happened. After these titanic wars, the Napoleonic War, described as the Great War at the time, fantastically destructive, appallingly expensive. Uh, 
there was an understanding by the politicians of Europe, they had to come together and build something, a system, a, st a state system whereby the, the aspirations of countries could be negotiated. S states could be bound by their treaty obligations. And what Wellington and Castlereagh and Metternich and these other great statesmen managed to build a state system that means that in the 19th century, battlefield deaths ran at about one-seventh of the 18th century. And again, that was deeply frustrating. Britain suffered many reverses. Russia swallowed a big piece of Poland. The Brits complained they didn't get their way. But rather than break, rather than go to war, rather than pull out of the state system, they accepted it because they realised that strategically on the whole, it was delivering peace. But an infuriating, inefficient, annoying peace, but peace and prosperity. And that was what the primary British aim was. But of course, Britain also tried insularity. At the end of the 19th century, we've all heard of splendid isolation, this idea that Britain had this wonderful empire, could not really worry about what happened in Europe. Well, the issue of splendid isolation is fine, but it means that if you absent yourself from what's happening on the continent, you have absolutely no control over what's going on there at all, and you have to live with the consequences. Now, in the, what happened during Britain's sort of period of splendid isolation is that in 1870, Germany sprang into existence. Britain could have stopped that happening. Britain easily could have stopped that happening. When, Germ when Prussia invaded Hanover, which Queen Victoria's cousin was ruling, Britain could have said, no, 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 you're not having Hanover. We don't want a German superstate. But Britain was splendidly isolated at that point, worrying about the Indian Empire and Burma and conquering other bits of the world. So we, we had to lump this German superstate, which over the next 100 years would provide several massive challenges uh, to Britain. And think about the First and Second World War in that context as well. Many historians think that the appalling, the tragedy of the First and Second World War, the least worst option was probably trying to, well, one of, who knows. But the, the argument given is that by getting involved, at least you've got some control over the outcome. It's going to be messy, it's not going to be exactly what you want, but you've got some control. And what you would end up in the First World War, if the British had not fought in the First World War, you'd have ended up with a, a massive German superstate controlling Central and Northwest Europe, at the very least. Maybe that was not worth the deaths of nearly a million Brits. I can't answer that question. But that's what would have happened. And would, and, and would, that, have, would that have brought, and the long scheme of British history suggests that would have brought Britain and Germany into conflict later on. Ireland is a good example. Ireland was neutral during the Second World War, it was splendidly isolated. And Ireland had to sit and watch as fascism and democracy fought it out. Absolutely neutral. Maybe that's fine. But had fascism won, Irish history would have been fundamentally altered. Fundamentally altered. And they had absolutely no say in the outcome of that story. I think, and to bring it just right up to the modern world, we've got 15 minutes of questions, so I'll bring it right to the modern world. The, 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 the migration crisis in the Aegean and the southern Mediterranean was very interesting, I thought. It, was, it played an important part during, you know, Farage had those big signs with all the, with all the migrants coming in. And on one hand, you think, God, migrants come flooding, Merkel's letting a million, this is all just crazy. We need to, let's just, like, you can understand why you'd look, you'd, you'd fall back to the certainty of saying, let's pull up the gates of the channel, hope for the best. The fact is, that migration problem is our problem, whether we're in Europe or we're not in Europe, it, it, it becomes our problem. Failed, if, if Greece becomes a failed state, history suggests that is going to become our problem. If, if, if massive migration challenges force Italy into the hands of right-wing populists, that becomes our problem. So the solution, the, the, what we can either do is get in there, get round tables in the, e, in the EU in Brussels. Infuriating. And if you guys, I'm sure, have lots of meetings in Brussels. It's a nightmarish place. And, but have some modicum of influence, or we wait for the result of whatever that migration crisis might be. And there will be important results. I think basically I'd finish on this idea, which is history suggests that you can distance yourself from events. You can distance yourself from the great currents of Europe. But there is absolutely nothing you can do to ensure that they keep their distance from you. Now, it's totally 15 minutes of questions. You've got 15.39. That's not bad going. Um, let's, thank you very much. But uh, let's, uh, yeah, we'll have a little applause. Thank you. Um, if anyone's got questions, I, we can do them. Oh, sorry, you're in charge of questions. Come take a seat, come, OK, fine. Here we go. So I'm not used to having Thank you very thing. much, Dan. That is fantastic. Go. You've teed it up questions uh, uh, beautifully. Perhaps I could just start with one about, uh, about what of interest in history at the moment, Dan. It just feels to me, looking at 
popular culture, we've had the darkest hour, we've had new civilizations uh, series starting on, on, on the BBC. Um, you're doing a, a multi date tour of theatres, talking about history, exhausting sort of schedule you're setting yourself. Um, do you think there's, there's a greater popular appetite? For history at this time than there has been hitherto, and, and why would that? That's a very good question, and the answer is absolutely yes. Now, I'm so I'm 40 this year, and I go, I went to school in the 1990s, and when you did history at school in the 1990s, everyone looked at you like you'd gone absolutely mad, uh, particularly Americans. I, I used to go to, I went to America after school, and I travelled around, and they, I said, they said, what are you going to study at university? I go history. They go, well, you want to be a teacher? Which first of all was odd because what's wrong with being a teacher? And secondly, well, that was it, nearly everybody said that it was fascinating. The history was almost useless unless you wanted to teach to teach history. And that's because the 1990s, we we were in that. As you remember, history was finished. We were all fine. Everything was over. The Berlin Wall came down, uh, and and chi China was um, not a threat yet, and uh, we Russia was a sort of liberal democracy. Russia was making look like Russia might become a liberal democracy. And democracy was in the ascendant. And so there was, it seemed odd to spend your time studying history in the 1990s. And then 9-11 happened. And history has come. I mean, history now is coming at us like, if, if, you, if you want to talk about Korea, if you want to, want to talk about Iran, Syria, I mean, Syria is, is a story that without history makes n no sense at all whether it's the internal religious splits within Syria between Sunni, Shia, Alawite, yeah. whether it's the, po the politics of the region, Turkey's interest in Syria, uh, or, and, uh, and, and, you know, 100 years on from the end of the Ottoman Empire, here we are, Syria's in a civil war, it's absolutely classic. Uh, and then, of course, the rise of populism in the States, the strong history of, of, of mad populists in the States, uh, populism in Italy, populism arguably here or, or in, in Poland, we are living in a time where history, you're absolutely right, is, 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 t is totally back. And, yeah. and, young, and young people who I occasionally meet uh, are really into it. So I, when I, if, I put, if I put a podcast, you know, someone calls Donald Trump a fascist, and I, put a, I just go immediately on the podcast, interview a historian of fascism, stick them on the podcast. That episode goes absolutely bananas. You know, there, there, is, there, is a, there is a trending fascination at the moment with context. People yeah. want to know where this stuff comes from. And look, you know, look at the NRA in America. Everyone's talking about the second. Everyone in America is, and all of us, after these shootings, we're all debating a, a sentence that was written down in the late 18th century. You know, that couldn't be a more important example of our history is continuing to reach into all of our lives, reaching into classrooms in America and changing people's lives. Right. Thank you. Right. Questions from the audience. Who would like to go first? I can see all in four or five rows You've got a hand going back. Up. And... Uh, are there any more? No, we'll go to the app. Yes. And if you can say who you are, as usual, yeah. please. Uh, George Graham. I'm a trustee of a pension fund. Uh, Dan, you outlined a, a long-run grand strategy of avoiding the dominance of a single European power against us. Why do you think that grand strategic argument was so hard to make in the Brexit debate? Uh, was Napoleon right that we're a nation of shopkeepers? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an, I think people didn't want to talk, both, both in the referendum here in Scotland and in, and in the Brexit referendum, the, the uh, status quo side didn't enjoy talking about uh, really anything other than simple messaging around currency, money, mortgages, uh, and, and yeah, I'm not a political strategist, and I've read lots of articles saying that was exactly the right thing to do. Obviously, in terms of the Brexit referendum, it didn't work entirely. But, but it does seem to me that there would have been space to talk about those bigger ideas. And, and, I, and as I sort of tried to say in the speech, you know, it's this idea of foreign domination of the continent, but also it's minimising it's minimizing the potential for internal disruption within the British Isles, within the Isles. Because historically, we are a mad, diverse bunch who fought each other constantly. Again... Uh, unlike, say, Japan, where there's ethnic, religious homogeneity across that archipelago, even, although they fought each other plenty, you know, we have had we have had dozens of states, statelets, mini empires carved out of these archipelagos in, in this archipelago in the last two thousand years. So there's two big strategic ideas there that or, already we are seeing, uh, we, and we're seeing the consequences of the, of the second one. You know, we're seeing there is there is now. The, the attitude along the, uh, uh, between Britain and Ireland has deteriorated, I'm sure, you know, no doubt will get solved. But that is some, all I can say is something that historically policymakers were very, very leery of and would have attempted to minimise. Okay, thank you. 
Any more from the audience? Yes, just uh, near the front here. Yes, number one. Thank you. Uh, fascinating talk. I'm Landroy from State Street Global Advisors. I'm a student of economic history, but I'm an economist, and I feel that uh, many economists nowadays believe that the models we created failed because we didn't learn from history. And a very good professor of mine I would recommend most people read called Deirdre McCloskey, used to be Don McCloskey on International Women's Day, I pride to say that, uh, wrote the book Rhetoric of Economics and saying, if you're so smart, how come we missed out on so many history lessons? Any comments? Well, I mean, obviously historians, particularly since 2008, love taking the piss out of economists at every opportunity. <coughs> I mean, I do think historians need to be careful. We are mostly enumerate, uh, and therefore I think it's been convenient for us that, that the, uh, lots of economists got it, got it wrong in, in the build-up to 08 and beyond. Um, but yes, uh, I, I think that the, I, I think it, you have to be wary of, of the idea that you can use mathematical uh, and economic certainty when in, in, in predicting the future and in, in discussing this sort of stuff. Um, the Brexit referendum is also a reminder that history is messy and emotional, and politics is messy and emotional. I think history can give you that. History can remind you that. We had a, the excellent speaker that was on just before me saying, one thing we've learned in the last few years is that if you can imagine it, it might well happen. <laughs> And, and I think historians were more ready for that than perhaps economists were. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, see what we, uh, questions we have on the app. Um, uh, Dan, you did say they could be as rude yeah, as, as you like, but I didn't expect people to ask how tall is Dan and where did he get that jacket? All right, yes. Um, <laughs> but uh, I must anyway. Show you, I'll show you the jacket. I'm, I'm, two, I'm what, six foot five and a bit, so I'm, in Europeans, I'm 200. I'm 200 centimetres. Actually, do you know what? I'm 199. It's bloody annoying. Uh, and um, so that's that. And so basically, two questions people always ask me is, uh, how tall are you? And that's that. And then what relation are you to Jon Snow? And he is my, so he, there you go. So he is my dad's first cousin once removed. Sorry, he's my first cousin. My first cousin was Marie, my dad's my first cousin. So, but they grew up like brothers in sort of this, you know, typical, you know, imperial family whose parents were away for 30 years at a time. So they, they grew up together. Uh, and so they're like brothers. So he's like an uncle. The jacket is, is from an online uh, tailor. Um, and it's got a, they offered me a, a, a cartoon on the inside. So I got my wife oh. and child. Oh. There you go. Just deal with that. I wasn't expecting you to answer that, but thank you. Um, um, let's move on. So, um, a question of, very appropriate <coughs> for where we are uh, today, a question about Scotland's historically different relationship with Europe. Uh, and to what extent do you think that explains Scotland's different vote in the, uh, from, from, from the rest of the UK in the referendum? Yeah, I think, I think, um, I think that's very important. Uh, Scotland regarded, Scotland in a way is a, is a sort of small, is a version of England. So Scotland's strategic priority is what the bloody hell do we do about the English? Uh, they've got this massive, in terms, of the, in terms of the regional, they've got a massive regional superpower next door to them who keep invading them. So, so in the same way, that they're, they're thinking, uh, just, as the, just as policymakers in London are thinking, what we need to try and avoid is a, is a unified, hostile Europe. Scottish policymakers are, th are thinking, we have a unified, hostile England. Um, although it's quite useful when it's not unified, and, and they've made every opportunity during English civil wars to get involved, rightly, and, and again, try and get on the front foot, advance south of the Tweed. You know, Scotland has realised, got Scotland's kings endlessly pushed into, to, into England and occasionally into, into Ireland as well. Uh, and, and therefore, Europe became, uh, when in, Scotland was independent, Europe became less of a threat and more of a, it's my enemy's enemy, a, a potential ally. Now, Scotland had a very nuanced relationship with places like France and, and was in danger of becoming a sort of French colony at one point and would, would push back very fiercely, you know, proud of their own independence in that respect. So, so again, it, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting balancing. Then, then, but then Scotland really does buy, this is the thing that people tend to forget now, some people tend to, Scotland really buys into the British project in the 18th century and 19th century. So Scotland becomes almost the almost an engine of Britishness uh, in, in the 18th and 19th centuries, and I think t t absorbs a lot of those, of those formerly English concerns and things ab about, uh, about Europe. But, but now, 
a, you know, a fascinating, absolutely fascinating juncture, and we'll see whether we'll see where that the next cog, how the next cog turns. Okay, we got more questions from the floor, please. Just looking for. Oh, right, I can see a hand right at the at the yeah. back. Yes, uh, number four. I think he's on his way to you. Thank you. Hello, hi. Uh, my name is Corina. I run the Winmark Pension Chair Network. Any predictions uh, for for the future after? Britain leaves the, the EU. Well, the old prediction game, eh? I mean, it's so annoying when historians go, I don't know, when I quit, we say the know-it-alls about the past and they hate making predictions. I mean, I, I, I think um, what, what, the only thing I would predict is that we are, going to, we are going to discover that what happens in Europe, what happens in Brussels has enormous impact. So uh, just as Norway has discovered that and spends a lot of time and money lobbying in, within Brussels. There are Norwegians all over Brussels talk, talking about you know, fisheries, smart grids, uh, the Arctic, uh, obviously natural resources. Uh, so so we, will, we will find that because we always have done. Whether or not, whether or not there's even something called the EU anymore, whether or not there's anything, but we will find that, that the hope, I suspect we'll find that the hope that we can use modern technology, modern shipping, I mean, and the fact is the world does change. You know, I've got, uh, there may come a day when a Hyperloop joins us to New England and we ha there is a, re a, a genuine reality of, of a closer kinship and bond with North America than there, there is at the moment. I, I, th that may happen. But, for, but until that day, we will spend more, to, and it will be expensive and it will be frustrating because that's what, multilateral negotiations that's what they happen and we will and we will have losses and we're going to have wins and we're going to have compromise that leaves everyone unhappy so i think that that would be my my predict my very woolly uh, prediction okay, thank you uh, i'm sure i saw more hands yes one waving vigorously right, over by the Frank. side there thank you Francois Barker from Evershed Sutherland i'm a humble pensions lawyer not worthy to ask you a question but let me do so anyway do you think the current vogue for protectionism and for populism could mean that Brexit isn't the first exit? Oh yeah, well I mean, I mean obviously the Italian election result was fascinating, wasn't it? Uh, it, it I, I mean, it, of course it, it could be. Um, it's, it's very easy to blame supranational, as we know, I mean, I'm not saying anything, the populism thing's really, uh, the other day someone explained populism to me in a good way, because people like European sort of, Metropolitan elitists always call populism, they tend to refer to sort of right-wing nationalist populism. But I think populism exists at both ends of the political scale and, and, and spectrum, and it is, it's a very nice way of looking at it, which is it, it's, it's ostentatiously simple solutions to big and complex problems. So whether it's Mussolini or Jeremy Corbyn, or that's slightly unfortunate, but I mean, it's, whether, whether, it's, uh, whether it's people on the right or the left is what I mean to say. It, it's, it's telling the population, it's telling people that your problems are, have a very, are, are, appear huge and insurmountable, but that's only because elites are, 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 unpre are not prepared to just do, the, do the, the simple, you know, slashing the red tape or getting rid of an ethnic minority, whatever it might be. And that if, if, if those relatively simple things are done, if you build a wall on the Mexican border, lots of things will change. Your urban crime and decay and, and the loss of jobs to international competitors will, will all disappear if you build a nice wall. I mean, that's the definition, in a way, of populism. So, so I think uh, this tide of populism we're seeing at the moment is because people are hurting and there are easy, there are apparently easy solutions. So to leaving, be, leaving the EU, le getting rid of Schengen, free movement of people. It's too many, it's too many foreigners, it's too many migrants. Uh, and I think that, because these societies are under, what's odd is that we, I mean, I think weird about Brexit is we're the ones leaving and our youth unemployment rate is the lowest in Europe or something. You know, we, there, are, there are societies in Europe that have got enormous problems at the moment. And, and so you're absolutely right. There's a huge, huge uh, potential for, for quite radical discontinuity. Okay. Thank you. We've got time, I'm sure, for one more. I know uh, this is the big the... night, everyone. You want to get out drinking. and This is the last night at Edinburgh, so we won't delay too oh, long. Well, we've got a, a couple of minutes. Uh, one from our, I think our, our chairman has his hand up, and we can't deny him. So, uh, chairman, Richard Butcher. The chairman? Oh, there he is. Well, first of all, just an observation. If eminent pensions lawyer Dr. Francois Barker is not worthy of asking a question, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'm sorry to bother you. Um, it's prospects for our own government. You talk about messy compromise, 
Uh, that's the outcome of this sort of decision about leaving the European Union. Um, so what does history teach us is then, uh, what's the likely impact going to be on the stability of our own government over the next few election cycles? Yeah, well, that's a very good question, as I'd expect from the chair of this illustrious event. Um, I think what it, what it, you're right, because if, if, you, if you unleash uh, populist ideas, if you, like the SNP did here and, 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 people, and some Brexiteers did across the UK, if you say everything's going to be a sunlit utopia if you, if you tick this box, because the answer to our problems is actually very, very straightforward. The answer to our problems is very straightforward. We just leave the EU and everyone will be loads richer and happier. If, if you unleash those and you build up those, then, then you're storing up big potential problems when those, when those are not realised, when, when those aspirations and those promises are, prove you know, very challenging to deliver. And so I think you're right. I think what you're getting at is, is that it is going to be a motor of instability because prom promises will not be kept. It's going to be very easy for people on the extremes. I mean, Nigel Farage has got a very easy job at the moment because whatever deal happens, he goes, well, I told you. It would have been so different if, I, you know, if we had PR and I had 50 MPs. This would all be completely different. Uh, and he's allowed, he can sit there from the wings and just lob in hand grenades. And it's an absolutely fantastic place to be politically. Because whatever happens, we're not going to win just with, as the SNP would have struggled to deliver a Scotland that was, you know, I remember going on Twitter when, when, and seeing those people that passionately believe in Scottish independence and they were saying, with independence, we're going to, and they'd write these lists of things that were going to happen. And they were like, they were just fantastically utopian and extraordinary, completely extraordinary. And, and I think the same is, is true of a, a certain Brexit constituency. And, and they're going to be very easy to rile up. And, and keep that discontent and that anger kind of going because the answer is we're going to end up with like a Norway, we're going to end up between Norway and Canada, which is like no one, who voted for that? You know, but, but actually that's, that might be, end up being the best option. And it, and, but it's going to be, but, you, but the front pages and the political speeches write themselves. You know, the, the, the fishermen of Whitby are still not allowed to catch whatever they want. And it's just, and, and, and yeah, so a big potential motor of instability. OK, we're, we're, we're getting towards the end of the session, but let's just finish down with one more question from the app, which is, uh, if you could live in one period in history, I bet you always get this one, which one would it be? This is, this is another one. It's like the hype. People always ask. And the, well, first thing to say about this is obviously today. Let's not, we, let's not forget that when you watch the news on the telly, fewer people now around the world living in poverty die, die violently and living in extreme pain per capita than ever before in human history. We are extraordinarily lucky to be living today. And this is another thing about populists that really upset me as a historian, is when they try and peddle, like when they trade broken Britain, when they say make America great again, it's, it's, it is, they're, tr they're, they're selling a very false prospectus there uh, because we, are, we have never been luckier as a species. You can drink too much, fall over in the street, someone will put you in the back of an ambulance and get you a new liver that they'll put in for free in a hospital. <laughs> That is completely extraordinary. That is historically extraordinary. Today, I landed in an airport in Edinburgh. I checked the weather forecast on the supercomputer in my pocket. I summoned a taxi with the supercomputer in my pocket. I used an OS map to go to the Edinburgh Pentlands. I then hiked in the Edinburgh Pentlands, did a few work calls whilst on top of them, prepared my speech on Evernote on the supercomputer, came back, ordered a taxi the same way, and then came and talked to you guys. This is an, um, that's an unbelievable quality of life, com you know, compared to even 10 years ago. And you know, when I wake up in the morning with joint pain, I can deal with it with analgesics. Dentistry exists today. We are so lucky to be able to say, but in the spirit of the question, I should say, because we're running out of time. Uh, the 18th century, because the male fashion was excellent. Uh, and and the, uh, the 18th century, because that was a time when exploration, science, constitutional reform, the modern world was really, really taking shape in the 18th century. Big ideas, Mary Wollstonecroft thinking about the rights of man and women, uh, John Locke, Hume, uh, well, you know, uh, and then just before the 18th century slightly, you know, people like Newton. Uh, this was when the Industrial Revolution started happening, the, the Enlightenment. This was a time when, when this city exploded. Uh, it was an extraordinary time to be alive. So I would love to go and check that out very briefly. <laughs> Well, Dan, uh, thank you very much for that. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, the bad news is uh, we are out of time, just about. The uh, consolation is the drinks reception 
is about to start. Dan, I think you're going to join us for, yeah, for sure. a quick one. Yeah. Thank you. Thank and you very much for coming. For drinks. Uh, <laughs> just uh, before you go, the, the drinks are uh, kindly supported by Marketing Edinburgh, so thank you to them Good. for their uh, hospitality. Don't forget, please, to rate the session. Yes. I think the details uh, are on the screen. Uh, and Dan, thank you very much. Informative, enjoyable, fantastic. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.